The story of the founding of Rome is a tale that was often told by the Romans as the earliest history of their ancient city. As the legend goes, Rome was founded on April 22, 753 BC by twin brothers Romulus and Remus. The boys were the son of Rhea Silvia, a daughter of King Numitor of Alba Longa, who was impregnated by the god of war, Mars. When the twins were born, King Numitor's younger brother, who had previously deposed the king, attempted to have the boys murdered by drowning them in the Tiber River in hopes to avoid any new rivals to the throne. Somehow, the infants survived and eventually washed ashore near Palatine Hill. Here, the legend has it that they were suckled by a she-wolf and later found by Faustilus, a local shepherd. He and his wife took the boys in. And with age, Romulus and Remus became leaders of a group of shepherd warriors before finding out about their true lineage. Knowing that they had a valid claim to Alba Longa, the twins launched an attack on the city, assassinating their great uncle and placing their grandfather back on the throne. They then decided to found their own city nearby, at the site where they suckled from the she-wolf as babies. But a conflict between the brothers ended with Romulus murdering his brother, and Romulus alone then founded the city of Rome, named after none other than himself. Romulus now had to address the obvious problem of somehow populating his new town, which currently had no woman. To overcome this obstacle, Romulus devised a plan to invite his neighbors, the Sabines, to a festival at which he had their woman kidnapped. This, unsurprisingly, triggered armed conflicts between the new Romans and the Sabines. But thankfully for Romulus, the abducted woman actually came to mediate and insisted on putting an end to the war before Rome could be captured. The subsequent peace treaty allowed for the merging of the two kingdoms and made both Romulus and the Sabine king Titus Tatius the population's authority. Additionally, to help with the growth of Rome, Romulus invited both exiles and fugitives to come and seek asylum in his kingdom. By the time that his counterpart, King Titus, died, no heir replaced the Sabine, which left Romulus once again the sole monarch over the new city. After the founder's death, there would be six more kings until the kingdom would become a republic instead. This, of course, is only one theory as to how Rome came to be. The somewhat outlandish tale has been questioned by many historians over the years, and other hypotheses concerning how Rome was founded exist and have been supported by some curious figures. For one, Strabo, a Greek historian, wrote of another tale that claims an Arcadian colony first occupied what would become Rome, and the city itself was founded by a Greek man from Arcadia named Evander. According to Strabo, a Roman historian, Lucius Coelius Antipater, also agreed with this theory. Still, another belief is that Rome was founded by Romos, a son of King Odysseus and Circe, which would have made the Romans of Greek descent and may have become an unfavorable fact as discord with the Greeks began to grow. Martin P. Nilsson, a Swedish scholar, explains that this theory may, in fact, have once been the main story of Rome's birth. But as the concept of Greek ancestry became more embarrassing for the Romans, they likely would have tweaked the story, changing the name of Romos to the native name of Romulus. But the name Romos, which later turned into the native name of Remus, was never fully forgotten and would account for the story of two founders, not just one. Further lending to the possibility of having a potentially hidden Greek descent in his satire The Caesars, Emperor Julian is said to have had Alexander the Great say to the Romans, I am aware that you Romans are yourselves descended from the Greeks. And yet another option 
is that the Trojan prince Aeneas actually founded Rome, as described by Virgil, a Roman poet, in his epic known as Aeneid. Both Emperor Augustus and Julius Caesar are said to have been descendants of Prince Aeneas as well. Historically speaking, regardless of how Rome was truly founded, we know that there were supposedly seven kings in total during the first era of establishment, beginning with Romulus and eventually ending with the Etruscan kings. The final three monarchs of this civilization were Priscus, Tullius, and Superbus. A problem is evidence with not necessarily the belief that the last three kings were Etruscan, but with the limited number of kings in total. If only seven kings reigned over 243 years, that would average roughly 35 years per monarch, which has been strongly discredited by modern historians while it is possible that Rome could have been ruled by only seven kings in its first years, there is no way to prove the unlikely claim due to the lack of contemporary evidence. When the Gauls sacked Rome during the Battle of Aelia in the 4th century BC, they destroyed a large amount of Rome's existing records, and many of the rest became lost or damaged over the following years. One way or another, Rome's foundation as a monarchy came to an end in 509 BC, when the Romans finally gained control back from the Etruscan people who had been ruling over them for the past three reigns. As the story goes, Lucius Tarquinius Superbus, the last king, was deposed after his son Sextus Tarquinius committed a heinous crime against Lucretia, a noblewoman, which resulted in her death. Lucretia's father, husband, and even the king's nephew came together with the goal of punishing the royal family by overthrowing the king himself. Both the Roman military and senate decided to support this coup. Not only would King Tarquinius be overthrown, but the kingship in its entirety would be abolished by the senate, and the majority of his duties were instead transferred to two elected consuls. Each consul would act as a type of checks and balances for each other, with each term lasting only one year, and any consul being at the mercy of the law if they abused their power while in office. The first two consuls were Brutus and Collantinus, although the latter was a relative of the deposed king and was eventually forced to give up his position and go into exile. Publius Valerius Publicola would take Collantinus's place as the second consul. King Tarquinius did make a few attempts to regain his throne and re-establish the Roman monarchy, such as with the Tarquinian conspiracy the same year of his removal and two battles within the Roman-Etruscan wars shortly after. The former king proved disappointingly unsuccessful, and the Republic remained. At this point in time, while the Republic may have been an improvement from the monarchy, it still was not like a democracy. Instead, the Senate, which was made up of purely aristocrats or patricians, were responsible for voting in each consul for every term, and the lower classes, known as the plebeians, did not possess any type of power to challenge or influence decisions made by the Senate. Additionally, there were notable efforts made to separate and distinguish the varying levels of society. Marriage between patricians and plebeians was strictly forbidden. As the Republic aged and developed, the plebeians did slowly begin to gain more and more influence and power, including eventually becoming eligible for the position of consul. But the patricians essentially maintained their overall authority by means of their wealth. Another curious feature of the early Roman Republic was the way it dealt with emergencies. In the case of, for example, a military emergency in the form of war, the Senate and consuls had the ability to basically elect a temporary dictator who would assume complete authority over Rome for the time of the crisis. The position was quite frankly a dangerous one, as it gave the dictator unchecked control and power in an already chaotic time. But 
for a plebeian by the name of Cincinnatus, the concept worked as had hoped. The aristocrats brought Cincinnatus from his farm during a military emergency that they felt required the appointment of a dictator to take charge and lead the troops as well. After a mere 15 days, Cincinnatus led the Romans to victory, voluntarily stepped down from his temporary position, and returned back to his farm. By 449 BC, the Roman Republic had also established its first set of written laws, known as the Twelve Tablets. Contrary to the earlier structure of the Republic, these laws now aimed to make every citizen equal under the eye of the law. Finally, after refining the very foundations of the new Republic, Rome could move on to another goal, expansion. After slowly taking down each of its pesky neighbors, including the Sabines, one of the first major conflicts the young Republic found itself in was the Battle of Lake Regillus. At the start of the 5th century BC, the Latin League and the Romans met at Lake Regillus as Rome's new dictator at the time, Aulus Postumius Albus, hoped to defeat the remaining threat to Rome's growing authority. As the troops neared the battlefield, another close-by tribe known as the Volsci attempted to gather additional fighters to send in as further assistance for the Latin League, but they were unable to arrive in time because of how fast the Romans launched their side of the campaign. So, the battle would soon begin. At the helm for Rome stood Albus to guide the infantry, and Titus Ibutius Helva at his side as the master of the horse. Across from the Latin leader, Octavius Mamilius and Lucius Tarquinius Superbus, the previously shamed and ousted final Roman king. This latter participant is said to have played a huge role in the passion with which the Romans would fight, given the high level of animosity between the people and their deposed ruler. As the clash began, the leaders on both sides were quick to participate in the combat, and both Mamilius and A. Butius were injured by one another. The Roman cavalry dismounted and took things to the ground, which sent the Latins backpedaling so far that the Romans managed to capture their camp. The Latins subsequently fled from the battlefield, leaving the Romans as the clear victors despite the initial damage taken. While this was a successful campaign, it would not be the last time that the Latins would challenge Rome. The Battle of Mount Algidus was fought between Rome and a neighboring Latin tribe called the Aequi. This conflict arose in 458 BC after the Aequi had continuously attacked Rome and the surrounding territories, and a truce between the Tusculans and Aequi was broken by the latter. The Aequi invaded Tusculum once more, and Rome leaped into action to assist its ally. The Romans were able to surround the Aequi and attacked with two separate armies, which led to the tribe's defeat at Mount Algidus. Just over a decade later, though, these armies would clash once again, although now they were joined by the Volsci tribe as the Latins continued to pose a threat to the Romans. Originally, it appeared that the Latins may overpower the Romans this time, as they captured their base camp and inflicted roughly 6,000 Roman casualties. But somehow, yet again, the Romans managed to change the tide and force the Latins into retreat after splitting the Roman troops into two groups and hit their enemy forces from multiple sides at the same time, as they had done in the prior battle as well. This gave the ultimate triumph to Rome, and ensured the Republic's superiority over the Aequi in particular, as well as the rest of its immediate neighbors. By this point, the Roman Republic's main goals had been to first establish its foundation in terms of a political structure and basic systems for functioning, as well as consolidating its power at home and proving its dominion over the surrounding Latin cities and tribes. But these were only the first few steps in building a powerful republic. Rome needed to focus on growth and expansion, but this was often easier said than done. Rome wasn't alone in wanting to gain new territory and stretch authority, and this meant that the young republic not only had to go on the offensive, but also on the defensive, especially when it came to the Celts, or the Gauls in particular. In 390 BC, 
the rivalry between the growing Roman Republic and the Gallic tribes reached its peak. The Gauls had already established themselves in the Po Valley by the beginning of the 4th century BC, slowly inching closer to Rome, and were soon invited into the Etruscan town of Clusium. The Gallic tribe, known as the Senones, led by their king Brennus, accepted the invite from Maroons of Clusium, who had hoped to take revenge on a man by the name of Lucumo, who had allegedly slept with his wife. At some point after the Senones arrived in Clusium, though, things turned sour, and Arun sent a request to the Romans asking for help in mediating the situation. Rome was willing to assist, and sent three ambassadors out to talk with the Gauls. Upon arrival, the Romans quickly worked to deter any type of attack against Clusium, and asked the Senones to come to the table for peace negotiations. Rome asserted that in the case of a Gallic attack on the town, the Romans would be swift to declare war in return and protect their allies. Brennus countered that he would not order an attack on Clusium if Arons would hand over some of his territories to the Senones. Negotiations became heated, and an argument broke out which quickly spiraled into a full-blown brawl between Arunz's and Brennus's men. The Roman ambassadors, despite strict rules requiring them to stay a neutral mediating party, inserted themselves into the fight, and one of them went so far as to slay a Senone chief. The Romans had undoubtedly crossed a line, and the Gauls were no longer willing to stay and negotiate. Once the Gauls had decided what would be done in reaction to the Roman attack, Brennus sent his own representatives to Rome, where they sternly demanded that the three Roman ambassadors be handed over to the Senones. Because of who the Roman ambassadors were, all members of the powerful Fabia family, the Senate felt fairly stuck. They were much too pressed to do anything that may harm the Fabia family, yet they were also unwilling to be the reason why the Gauls may attack Rome. In an attempt to shift the blame and pressure off of themselves, the Senate tossed the issue to the people, who predictably favored their own. The Senones were outraged by the fact that the Roman ambassadors would go unpunished for their violation, and decided to take matters into their own hands. After Brennus' ambassadors returned to him with the news, the Senones quickly readied their army for war. As the Gauls marched through the surrounding cities on their way to Rome, startled citizens either fled or came to defend their towns. But the Senones made it clear, everywhere that they went, their only target was Rome. When the Gauls reached the Alia River near Rome, the Romans were completely caught off guard. They had not even partially anticipated the violently swift incursion, and were destructively slow in bringing together a defensive army. The troops had to prepare so fast that they failed to even set up a camp, and quickly got into a long-winged formation, which actually created a weak defense given how thin their line was. They did have an extra reserve unit, which they put on a hill, but Brennus was truly confused by this and thought that these troops were instead intended to ambush him and his men, so he went straight for them as opposed to the main Roman force. This shocked the Romans even more. Many of the soldiers retreated to the nearby city of Vey, while others fled into Rome, and the rest were struck down by the Senones as they continued the battle. When all was finished, the Gauls were were actually so taken aback by how easy their victory had been that they suspected the Romans may be planning a new ambush within the hour. When nothing happened, Brennus regrouped his men and continued the march to Rome. Another shock hit the Gauls when they reached the city gates, which were open and completely unarmed. Unbeknownst to the Senones, the Roman troops who had fled to Vey at the Battle of Alia had not warned the rest of Rome about the clash and why they hadn't returned. So, the Roman people had assumed those who had retreated to the capital were the only survivors from the battle, and the city was mostly evacuated. The men of military age and ability were sent to defend Capitoline Hill, while many citizens just dispersed. From then on, the Gauls began the sack and seizure of Rome. While the sack raged on, back in Vey, the remaining Roman troops began to come together with a plan to return to their capital. 
At first, the soldiers picked a centurion named Quintus Caedicius as their leader, but he shortly decided that the formerly banished Marcus Furius Camillus would make a better commander for their return to Rome. But. This required a messenger to be sent to Rome first, where he could speak to some of the Senate of Capitoline Hill and try to have Camillus's exile reversed. Although the messenger Cominius Pontius did manage to convince the Senate to approve Camillus's return as Rome's leader, he also may have unintentionally led the Senones right to the Romans on Capitoline Hill. Whether by luck or by a trail left by Pontius, the Gauls did manage to scale the hill and sneak up on the Roman men, despite the facts that there were actually guards on duty who should have noticed them coming. Instead, it was geese that were first startled by the Sinon intruders and woke up the Roman troops. One former consul, Marcus Manlius Capitulinus, sprung into action and shoved one of the Gauls off the side of the cliff, which caused more of the Sinon soldiers who were still on their way up to fall as well. A quick scuffle followed, but it was just as swiftly ended with the Romans successfully fighting off their attackers. Still, this didn't end the Sinon occupation of Rome, and there was now the task for the Romans of waiting until Camillus could arrive with an additional army from Vey. The only problem with this, though, was the fact that neither the Romans or Sinones could last much longer if the occupation continued. Both were suffering from famine, and the Sinones were also plagued by disease and heartstroke. Due to these new challenges, the Gauls decided to ask the Romans for peace negotiations, and played with the idea of being open to a paid ransom for the city. At first, the Romans said no, because they were still expecting Camillus to arrive with more men, but it wasn't long before they changed their minds due to increasing starvation. Negotiations then began, which resulted in an agreement for the Romans to pay the Sinones 1,000 pounds in gold so they would withdraw from the city. There are conflicting stories of whether the Sinones used dishonest scales or not to weigh the gold, although, according to one writer by the name of Livy, when accused of cheating the scales, Brennus threw his sword on the scale and barked the words, Vi Victus, or Woe to the Vanquished. Either way, the ransom would not actually be paid. Camillus finally arrived with his fresh army and told the Romans not to hand over the gold. Brennus argued that an agreement had already been made, but Camillus refused to accept this answer, given the justification that he had been made the highest ranking official in Rome, and yet the deal had not been struck with him. Instead, Camillus called the Gauls into combat against his men, and the starving and ill Sinones were effortlessly routed by the new Roman troops. Rome was now free, not by ransom, but by honorable military victory. After the Gauls left Rome, the triumphant republic was instantly thrown into a new war with the neighboring Latin tribes once again. This would continue for over three decades as Rome worked tirelessly to remain a powerful and growing entity. From that time, around 358 BC, there was a peace made with the Latin League due to an overwhelming fear of a new Gallic war brewing. But the often violent disputes with the Gauls, Etruscans, and even Greeks at one point would carry on for a few more decades. In 340 BC, a new Latin war broke out despite peace having been made less than 20 years prior. But the conflict was relatively short-lived and ended with a decisive Roman dominance. In 327, the Second Samnite War erupted between the Romans and Samnites, and there didn't seem to be a predictable victor for some time. Finally, in 305 BC, the Romans took the upper hand at the Battle of Bovianum and the war then came to a close by the next year when most of the Samnites' land was annexed by Rome. In an attempt to swiftly secure and consolidate this new claim to the territory, Rome attempted to set up colonies on the captured lands, but the locals were not so easy to subdue. In 298 BC, the Samnites rebelled against the new colonial authority and triggered another war The Battle of Populonia in 282 finally gave Rome authority over the Etruscans throughout the region, 
which in turn allowed them to focus on their new major obstacle, the Pyrrhic War. By the end of the 4th century BC, the Roman Republic had put in the hard work of establishing itself as a growing, dominant power over the Italian peninsula. Although some enemies and untrustworthy neighbors remained, Rome was still finding consecutive success and had only minimally struggled against its adversaries up to this point. But they were yet to clash with some of the more powerful opponents on the continent, such as the Greeks from abroad. Initially, a scuffle between Rome and the Greek-controlled city of Tarentum prompted the Romans to declare war, which in turn caused Tarentum to seek assistance of the Greek king named Pyrrhus. Although many Tarentines originally opposed the idea of reaching out to Pyrrhus as they believed that their freedoms and democracy would fall under the heavy-handed king, the city eventually opted to take the risk. Pyrrhus was told that if he would come to their aid, he would be given a coalition of 50,000 infantry and 20,000 cavalrymen from Tarentum, Samnium, Lucania, and Mesopia alike. This was an offer that Pyrrhus couldn't say no to, despite one of his advisors attempting to change his mind, because the thought of attacking Rome over Sicily had long been on the king's mind already, but until now, he had held no justification for such a war. With monetary and military aid being lent from Antiochus of the Seleucid Empire, Antigonus II of Macedon, and Ptolemy II of the Kingdom in Egypt, Pyrrhus set off for Italy on what would become a treacherous journey that left him with only 2,000 infantry and a few cavalrymen, alongside two elephants. Once in Tarentum, though, Pyrrhus enacted tyrannical restrictions on the local people and forced all men of military age to join his cause to make up for the thousands he had lost at sea. There was a short window of potential negotiation between Pyrrhus and the Roman consul Publius Valerius Laevinus, but the latter quickly turned down any attempts at compromise as he believed the odds were in Rome's favor in the case of war. It may have stunned Laevinus then that at the first major clash, the Romans faced a demoralizing defeat. Not only did Pyrrhus manage to wrangle the Romans, but he also earned himself newfound fame so impressive that those tribes and cities who had so far stayed neutral were now ready to join his fight. Nonetheless, Pyrrhus had lost many of his own best generals and soldiers in the battle, and as he marched towards Rome, he failed to capture any of the neighboring cities as he passed through. According to one version of the subsequent events, a writer by the name of Plutarch explains that Pyrrhus decided to negotiate peace at this point because it would ensure the war would end on a high note for the Greeks, but it would also help to secure his improved reputation after the prior battle. In hopes of striking such a deal, Pyrrhus sent Chinius to Rome to negotiate the freeing of Roman prisoners and ask for peace between Rome and Tarentum. While many within the Roman Senate were easily compelled to make such an agreement with Chinius, one man in particular, Appius Claudius Caiacus, managed to instead pull a unanimous vote in favor of expelling Chinius from Rome and requiring Pyrrhus to return to his own lands before asking for any more deals. If the Greeks opted to stay in Italy, the war would wage on. Both sides were now prepared for a new round of hostilities. In 279 BC, the next battle, known as the Battle of Asculum, ended yet again with a victory for Pyrrhus as he personally led his men into combat. Yet still, despite the victory, Pyrrhus himself supposedly celebrated his triumph with dampened enthusiasm, saying, If, if we, we are victorious, victorious in one, one more battle, battle with, with the, the Romans, Romans we, we shall, shall be utterly, utterly ruined. ruined. After a few more years of on and off clashes, Pyrrhus finally pulled out of Italy and met his end on the battlefield of Argus. Tarentum was now forced to surrender to the Romans, given that they lacked the defense they had relied on for so long thanks to the Greek king's ambitions. This was a huge moment for Rome. Almost all of the entire Italian peninsula was now under the shadow of the Roman Republic. The Latins nor Greeks could stop them, and the Roman power and dominion were only increasing. 
Rome was a powerhouse. Not even halfway into the 3rd century BC, the Roman Republic was rapidly on the rise. But they were about to confront a challenge unlike any they had yet faced. There was one more adversary that just may be Rome's match, or even superior. The Roman Republic was a decade away from a face-off with Carthage. It wasn't until Rome now turned to the nearby island of Sicily that its invincibility would come under the spotlight. After all, the Roman Republic was not the only expanding power of the day, and one other in particular had also set its sights on Sicily. Carthage. Though technically an amalgamation of Phoenician city-states and only informally an empire with the city-state of Carthage at the helm, this was the one rival that could truly send a shiver down Roman spines. Up to this point, Roman Carthage had been formal friends. They had established alliances, commercial ties, and mutual enemies even. But when the Roman Republic began to consider taking Sicily for itself, there quickly came to light one inevitable consequence. The Romans would have to fight off the Carthaginian Empire. Nonetheless, after a domino effect of events, such a consequence would come whether Rome wanted it to or not. In 288 BC, a group of mercenaries referred to as the Mamertines began to occupy the Sicilian city of Messana. After conquering the town, the Mamertines quickly became uncomfortable with their surroundings and reached out to both Rome and Carthage in hopes of gaining some degree of protection by 265 BC. At first, only Carthage came to their aid and agreed to assist the Mamertines, particularly against Syracuse if a Carthaginian garrison could be set up in Messana. This was a fair deal to the mercenaries, and so they accepted the terms. Rome, by this point, had not been extensively interested in Sicily, although a debate came about as to whether they should come to the aid of the Mamertines, who were fellow Italians. Still, the Roman Senate was torn between those who felt that the Mamertines had wrongly stolen Messana and did not deserve their protection, versus the rest who saw the potential selfish benefits of entering Sicily. After a general assembly decided to support the arguments of the latter, although worried about the potential reaction of Carthage, Rome unwaveringly gathered the necessary men under the command of Appius Claudius Caudex and set off to establish a garrison of its own in Messana. Whether there would have been a conflict simply from the Roman arrival or not is a question that would never be answered, because instead, the Mamertines reacted to the news of the coming Roman garrison by urging the Carthaginians to leave. Carthage was deeply displeased and offended by this request, as they had already come to the Mamertines' aid and were now being forced out simply to be replaced by Rome. In retaliation, the Carthaginians decided to form a new alliance with Syracuse, Holding nothing back, this new coalition besieged Messina as the Romans arrived in Sicily. The war began immediately. As the Romans neared the city, Anno, the Carthaginian commander, warned his empire's former allies that they soon would not even be able to wash their hands in the sea. Not expecting such an aggressive response so quickly, the Romans offered a peace deal to Anno. But this was immediately rejected. Nonetheless, the Romans could not be swayed by Carthage or even Syracuse. There is debate as to whether the Syracusans and Carthaginians voluntarily withdrew or if the Romans swiftly defeated them, but regardless, the siege was ended upon the Roman arrival to Messana, and still, the Romans could, in fact, wash their hands in the sea. The next move for the Romans, who now understood the real and imminent threats that would be posed by allowing Carthage to continue its expansion throughout Sicily, was to deal with Syracuse. Another commander, Manius Valerius Maximus Messala, took some of the Roman troops up to Syracuse and ambushed the city. Unable to defend themselves and unwilling to wait for Carthaginian assistance, Syracuse surrendered and agreed to align with the Romans and abandoned Carthage. A few surrounding cities followed suit, now fearing the potential backlash if they refused. Although the war would scarcely be fought on land, the Romans were quick to besiege the Carthaginian ally of Acragas, 
When the Carthaginians attempted to come to the rescue of their friend and lift the siege, they too were put down by the Romans, and the city was sacked. This infuriated Carthage and began a back-and-forth contest of taking and losing cities between the two sides, although the focus of warfare began to take a shift toward the sea. Initially, the Carthaginians had a superior naval force and more experience with such conflict. The Romans, however, were unfazed by this and understood that in order to win the war, they would have to establish a navy of their own. In a streak of good luck, a Carthaginian warship was spotted on low tide by the Romans, who captured the vessel and likely utilized it to create copies for their new naval force with some innovative additions. One of these upgrades made by the Romans was the Corvus, which was essentially a bridge that could be moved in any direction and utilized to lower infantry troops from the superior Roman army onto the Carthaginian ships. This addition proved to be greatly beneficial for the Romans, and helps to give them the upper hand throughout the naval warfare. Not many details of the series of raids and skirmishes have been maintained over the years, but it seems clear that the first few years of the conflict were more or less a stalemate, with now Rome and Carthage fairly equal at sea and a slight advantage for the Romans on land, though not many land battles were fought. Aiming to grab the high ground in some form, the Romans now look to Africa. Carthage's home soil. Four legions under the command of Marcus Regulus Attilius arrived in modern-day Tunisia as the First Punic War raged on overseas. Oddly, the Senate quickly called for the withdrawal of two of the legions, but the rest remained in Africa and quickly occupied the city of Tunis in 255 BC as negotiations continued to fail. The Carthaginians were far from giving up nonetheless, and one of their commanders, a Spartan by the name of Xanthippus, returned with a 16,000-strong army and routed the Romans in Africa. Only 2,000 of the Roman troops survived to flee, but they too perished on their way out as a storm at sea wrecked the fleet of nearly 100,000 men who had rescued them on the journey home. The following year, the war would resume back in Sicily once more. The Romans continued to gain territory and push the Carthaginians further and further out, although when they attempted to return to Africa, their ships were again destroyed at sea, keeping the Carthaginian homeland safe. In Sicily, the hopes of Carthage remained a risk, but the war was far from over. Despite consistent victories, Rome was yet to seize and hold all of Sicily. The war was draining both sides, and there seemed to be no end in sight. As the city of Lilibium refused to fall to the Romans despite valiant efforts to take it, the Battle of Drapana brought about a remarkable Carthaginian victory at sea. And with momentum in their favor, the Carthaginians beat down the Romans once again in the Battle of Phintius shortly after, bringing about a long break in a significant naval conflict. Nonetheless, following these battles in 249 BC, Carthage had lost all of its Sicilian holdings aside from Lilibium and Drapana. As the Romans battered the city walls in desperate attempts to finally free the island of Carthage's grip, the Carthaginian commander, Hamilcar Barca, ambushed the enemy using repeated guerrilla attacks. Despite temporarily capturing Eryx, Barca was not able to do much given the depleted state of a Carthaginian army. Having failed to garner monetary support from Egypt as they had hoped, the Carthaginians were close to having no choice but to surrender. Whether they knew this or not, the Romans decided that this would be the time to attack by sea once more. In 242 BC, Gaius Lutatius Catulus led a 200-ship fleet back to Sicily and straight to Drapana. By the next spring, the Carthaginians would collapse under the Roman bombardment. Nearly broke and exhausted from the years of war, Carthage was ready to call it quits and entered into serious peace negotiations for the final time. The Treaty of Lutatius would, at last, bring an end to the First Punic War. Under its terms, the Carthaginians were required to withdraw entirely from Sicily and additionally had to pay a significant sum of 3,200 talents in indemnity over the next decade. After 23 years of war that had battered both parties remarkably, the Romans had finally triumphed 
and proved once again, although the Roman Republic may stumble, it would not yet fall. Despite first having no solid plans to take Sicily and hefty concerns about even considering such a campaign, by the end of it all, Rome had taken Sicily and not even the Carthaginian Empire could stop it. The overall aftermath was rough for the losing side. Shortly following the resolution of the conflict, Carthage had attempted to withhold funds from some of the foreigners they had enlisted in the war, which led to a fairly disastrous revolt. For the most part, the rebels were eventually put down, but in the meantime, Rome managed to seize Sardinia and Corsica from Carthage, which the latter wanted back. By 237 BC, they were ready to launch a campaign to actually go recover them, but Rome was not going to allow that. They immediately deemed this as an act of war, and with Carthage still recovering from the decades-long conflict they had just gotten out of, this quickly put a stop to their endeavor. Rome managed to strong-arm their foe into not only giving up Sardinia, but also Corsica, in addition to a 1,200 talent payment. Despite agreeing, Carthage was furious with their Roman bullies, and many within the empire became radicalized. One of these men was Hamilcar Barca. Hamilcar was a famed and seasoned military leader on the side of Carthage. His forgiveness would never come, and until his last breath, it would be his biggest dream to get revenge for Carthage's loss in the First Punic War. But this would not be possible on such short notice, as Carthage still needed to refuel and revive itself from the first conflict, followed by the rebellion. So for now, Hamilcar looked to the Iberian Peninsula, not Italy. Carthage had already found success with their Phoenician colonies in Spain and the mass amounts of resources in the form of silver. So it seems the most logical to have Hamilcar go there to expand Carthaginian influence and claim. Upon doing so, he initially established himself in Cadiz and branched out from there. Over time, Hamilcar's army grew as he did his control of the region on behalf of Carthage. But in 229 BC, the great general drowned before ever having a chance to leave Iberia and seek the revenge he so badly wanted. Nonetheless, Hamilcar Barca had a son by the name of Hannibal, and he had raised his young boy with a burning passion and hatred for Rome, just as he himself maintained. This ensured that even after Hamilcar's death, Carthage would remain staunch enemies of the Roman Republic. In the wake of Hamilcar's absence, a man by the name of Hasdrubal the Fair would take over leadership in Carthage's Iberian possessions, which by now covered roughly half of the peninsula with an ever-growing army. By 226 BC, Rome was becoming somewhat anxious about the success that their foe was having over in Iberia. And so a treaty was signed on the agreement of Hasdrubal, which stated that Carthage would not expand into the south past River Ebro in Spain. And Hasdrubal meant what he said, but Hannibal, on the other hand, did not intend to follow such an agreement. After all, his father had taught him too well for such a thing. Only a few years after negotiations between Rome and Carthage, Hannibal took control of Spain after Hasdrubal was killed and almost immediately began to push beyond the current borders. The final straw for Rome would be when Hannibal captured Saguntum in 219 BC, stripping the Republic of one of their longtime allies in the region. Rome was deeply annoyed by this, and thinking that Hannibal couldn't be too hard to defeat, declared war by the spring of 218 BC. As Rome was gearing up for war with the new young gun of Carthage, Hannibal was cooking up his own plan, and he wasn't just an average general. He had learned quite a bit about Rome over the years, and he realized that the Republic had a good record of defeating opponents outside of Italy, but maybe not inside. If the Romans went after Hannibal in Spain, he might lose. But if he went after them in Italy, he might win. As a result, 
the young general left his brother in charge of their holdings with an army of his own, while Hannibal led the rest of their troops across the Alps in a matter of days. Although it would only take 15 days, Hannibal and his men faced more resistance than they had expected to as they marched towards Italy. The local Gallic tribes didn't take kindly to these intruders, and by the time the Carthaginians had finished their journey, over half of the troops had either been killed injured or deserted. Luckily for Hannibal, though, some of the locals in Italy were deeply unsatisfied with Roman rule and began to join the Carthaginian cause. As this new coalition marched on, Hannibal found success in multiple early skirmishes, like the Battle of Ticinus, the Battle of the Trebia, and the Battle of Lake Trasimene. The Romans had been taken aback by the developing situation, given that they had expected to go and fight Hannibal in the Iberian Peninsula, not on their own turf. But here he was, and the threat could not be ignored. So far, the Carthaginian general had been proven right. The Romans were looking weak on their own soil, and Hannibal had even managed to build up his army thanks to the locals. His confidence was on the rise, and it would get an even bigger boost in the summer of 216 BC when both sides met at Cannae. Earlier that year, Hannibal had captured a crucial supply depot in the town, which was disastrous for the Romans, and furthermore concerned them that the invader would soon take control of the entire city. As a result, the Romans decided to resolve the situation via combat. The first clash between the Romans, under the command of Consul Varro, and the Carthaginians was only a minor skirmish after the latter had ambushed the Romans on the way to Cannae. As the battle eventually played out along the river Aufidus, Hannibal would yet again crush the hometown Roman troops, sustaining fairly minimal casualties himself. This victory triggered a wave of support, with city-states all throughout southern Italy pledging loyalty to the Carthaginian side. And although this was a great achievement, Hannibal still found himself in a new predicament. He had no reinforcements. If he was to continue and head straight for Rome, itself, he'd have to do it without any backup, as his brother was held up back in Spain and no one could assist from Carthage. Rome, however, had adopted a new policy of essentially avoiding Hannibal entirely. They enacted the Fabian policy, which planned for the Romans to focus on defeating the Allies and blocking resources of the Carthaginians to first cripple Hannibal's forces. And as the latter's advantage seemed to be slipping away, Rome refused to accept any negotiations for peace. While Hannibal scrambled to retain control over his captured Italian territories, the Romans would attack wherever he wasn't. The Carthaginian offensive was beginning to fall apart. They failed to take Sardinia back, their authority was constantly being challenged, and no one was being sent to assist. By 207 BC, all Hannibal had left was Brutium. The Romans were now controlling the seas to cut off the Carthaginians from help or supply, and back in Spain, Hasdrubal had been beaten down and lost control, while a new wave of Carthage Italian allies were instead turning to Rome with their loyalty. Running on their building momentum, the Romans next moved to Africa to give Hannibal a taste of his own medicine. As Hannibal continued his struggle in Italy, the Romans, now under the command of Consul Scipio, invaded Africa in 204 BC and began to wreak havoc. Their Numidian allies joined them while the Carthaginians prepared to send troops back home under Gizgo to fight off the problematic Romans. Upon arrival, they were joined by their own Numidian ally in the form of Prince Syphax and his troops. This coalition eventually clashed with the Roman invaders and luck was not on Carthage's side. The Romans were victorious, and having now captured enough territory, including Tunis, to make Hannibal himself fear that the worst was yet to come for the city of Carthage, the Carthaginians were becoming desperate. Hannibal subsequently returned from Italy as negotiations occurred, but provided nothing between Rome and Carthage. His arrival in 202 BC would bring about the dramatic end to the Second Punic War.
As autumn rolled around, Hannibal and Scipio were ready to come face to face, literally. The opposing generals met personally at a plane near Naragara. It's unknown exactly what was said, but if any attempts had been made at ending the war through diplomacy, they failed miserably. With 35,000 and 40,000 infantry and 6,000 and 4,000 cavalry respectively for Rome and Carthage, the armies were ready for the final spectacle. In addition to his men, Hannibal also had 80 war elephants, but these proved to be a detriment instead of an aid. The Romans managed to dodge the initial carnage of the animals before scaring them back towards the Carthaginians, creating a chaotic scramble that allowed the Roman forces to swoop in and decimate Hannibal's left wing despite their best efforts to fight back. The Roman left wing then attacked Carthaginians' right flank, while the centers of both, led by Scipio and Hannibal themselves, marched toward each other. As this clash raged on, the Roman cavalry were destroying their Carthaginian counterpart before charging at Hannibal's center from the rear while the Roman center had them trapped from the front. This was it. This was the end of the Second Punic War, and just as those before him had done, Hannibal failed to defeat the mighty Romans. Though Hannibal would manage to escape, there was no more hope for Carthage to compete with their opponent. The Carthaginian government was forced to sue for peace and sign a treaty that would essentially bankrupt the once formidable adversary of the Romans. And now, Carthage was no longer allowed to declare war without the consent of Rome. They were also required to give up their naval fleet, altogether crushing any prospects of Carthage remaining a dominant military power as they had been. So, in spite of early wins and the leadership of the renowned Hannibal, Carthage lost, and it seemed that still, Rome was truly invincible. The outbreak of the Punic Wars marked an attention-grabbing period of Roman history that at times even overshadowed the contemporary events outside of the Carthaginian-Roman conflict. Another pesky rival of the Romans came in the form of the Illyrians, though they were not a competition for Rome in the same way as Carthage. Instead, the Illyrians posed a threat through piracy in the Adriatic, which eventually became an annoyance for the Romans. The first time these tensions boiled over was in 229 BC, when these people were mostly united under Queen Teuta, who had started to turn a blind eye, to say the least, to increasing piracy throughout the Adriatic. Rome at first ignored this as well, but once it began to impact Roman trade, the Senate opted to intervene through diplomacy. When this led to a Roman envoy getting killed on the order of the Queen, war became inevitable. The short Roman campaign of revenge saw a victory by the co-consuls and their troops in Illyricum, and Teuta eventually being cornered into signing a peace treaty that handed over some of her territories to Rome, while Illyrian fleets were forced to remain north of Lysus if in groupings larger than two ships at a time. Rome hoped that this would resolve the piracy issue, but the rule would shortly be broken nevertheless. The Romans had additionally been fighting with the Gallic tribes of northern Italy, some of which had actually seized and sacked Rome itself back in 390 BC. By now, in 225 BC, the Gauls of northern Italy and their Gallic allies across the Alps hoped to end a long-running back and forth with Rome by repeating the successes of 390 BC. Instead, the Romans had been heavily prepared and routed the aggressors at the Battle of Telamon and the following campaigns that suppressed any remaining resistance. By 220 BC, the Illyrian ruler Demetrio Sopharos, who had previously cooperated with the Romans, wanted to begin expanding his own power in spite of the prior peace agreement. Demetrios thus led a fleet of 90 ships south of Lysus and attempted to seize more territory, but he was quickly stopped by the Romans, who instead captured Demale 
and crushed the resistance at Pharos. Demetrios eventually gave up and sought refuge in Macedon, ending the Second Illyrian War, but only causing a break in hostilities, not an end. As if the Romans had not been preoccupied with enough wars already, they would simultaneously end up fighting a series of wars with Macedon. The first of these clashes began during the Second Punic War, after Philip V of Macedon decided to officially align with Carthage under the command of the renowned Hannibal. Hoping only to keep the former busy so they wouldn't intervene on behalf of Carthage, Rome sent some troops to clash with the Macedonians along the Adriatic until the Punic War was coming to an end. The truce was, predictably, only a temporary solution. But to be fair, this time, it was the Greeks who asked Rome to come back. There was a looming threat from the Macedonians and Seleucids, who had recently formed an unexpected alliance, and Rome's friends in Greece were uneasy about the potential ambitions of Philip V and Antiochus III. At first, the Romans had aimed to dissuade Philip in particular from interfering with their Greek allies, but the ultimatums given went wholly ignored. Furious at this response, or lack thereof, the Romans sent consul Titus Quintius Flaminius to enforce Rome's demands with the help of a Roman-Greek coalition. Despite Philip's earlier confidence in his ability to stand up to the Romans, he in fact could not. The Macedonians were utterly vanquished at the Battle of Cenocephali in 197 BC, and their ruler was put back in his place by Rome. This, however, only addressed one half of the newly formed alliance. The Seleucids were still a looming threat, and now, maybe even more so without Macedonia to balance them out. After the Second Macedonian War, the Romans had pulled entirely out of Greece, having no more interest in staying nor remaining intertwined in Greek affairs. But this left the Seleucid Empire as the dominant entity in the region, and Antiochus was by no means as uninterested as the Romans. Instead, he was looking to do what Philip had failed to. With Hannibal as the Seleucids' top military advisor, there was now not only a threat to Greece, but even to Rome. As a result, the Roman-Greek alliance pumped out another coalition force, this time commanded by Scipio Africanus and the war began on Rome's terms. It would end with the 191 BC Battle of Thermopylae and Battle of Magnesia and a Roman triumph. The end of this war also marks the start of the Seleucid Empire's demise, but the Macedonians were almost ready to give war with Rome another shot. Just as they had erroneously done after the Second Macedonian War, after the Seleucid War, the Romans pulled out of Greece with the assumption that there would now be peace in the region. Right on cue, mirroring the Seleucids, now the Macedonians attempted to expand as Philip had tried to do before his death and the succession of his son Perseus, who was now in charge. Nevertheless, even the new Macedonian king stood no chance against the Romans in the end, and by 168 BC, the Battle of Pydna brought an end to it all. This time, knowing they couldn't leave without destabilizing the region, Rome broke Macedon up into four individual states under its own watchful eye. Yet again, in 168 BC, tensions boiled over for a final time when the Romans watched their once ally in Illyrian King Gentius switch sides to align with the Macedonians. Once more though, this was a short-lived clash, and by the end of 167 BC, Rome was victorious and finally able to move on. Although the Fourth Macedonian War and subsequent Achaean War would follow, both of these were short-lived, and Rome remained unwavering and victorious in its Greek endeavors. And yet, the Roman Republic would be faced with yet another war, aside from those with Carthage, Macedon, the Seleucids, Gauls, and the Illyrians. This time, Rome was forced to address growing resistance surrounding their Iberian territorial holdings, particularly from the Lusitanian tribes 
in Hispania Ulterior. The Lusitanians have been clashing with the Romans for some decades as they maintained their autonomy in spite of Rome's expansion. But in 155 BC, the rebellions were becoming greater and more intense, and in 150 BC, the Romans lit an even bigger fire underneath them. After feigning a will for negotiation, the Roman praetor Servius Sulpicius Galba had thousands of Lusitanians massacred in cold blood. But one man by the name of Viriatus managed to escape the tragedy and would be elected to lead the tribes only a few years later. He quickly became a heroic icon for the tribes, and his bitterness towards Rome was as strong as ever. The battles were tough, but Viriatus would continue his resistance until his final breath, which would tragically be taken in 139 BC by three men who betrayed the ruler on behalf of the Romans, killing him in his sleep. And so, it was at this time that the Third Punic War had been wrapping up, and so was all that had occurred alongside it. Though war was not all that occupied Rome over the decades and centuries, it was surely a common part of the Republic's history. Nevertheless, back home, feats of architecture, politics, and arts were also being birthed, though regularly overshadowed by the conflicts that both challenged and solidified Rome's overwhelming dominance in Greece, Iberia, and surrounding areas. Still, it may have been the Punic Wars that truly surpassed the notability of all the other conflicts, as Rome and Carthage duked it out for who would be the most powerful influence from Italy all the way to North Africa. As these wars were raged across the map and the Romans piece by piece dismantled their enemy's empire, the Republic was concurrently putting a stop to each and every other rival, challenger, and general enemy. While the First Punic War lit the fire of aggression between the dueling powers, it was the Second Punic War that would secure the hatred both sides had for each, and ensure that Rome, after back-to-back -back victories, would remain the superior entity. But more was to come. Carthage had been drastically weakened and crippled by the most recent war and peace treaty, but it nevertheless still existed. And this bothered one too many Romans. After Rome's triumph in the Second Punic War, Carthage had a steep price to pay in talents, land, and military autonomy. Possibly one of the most significant restrictions that Rome had now placed on Carthage was the agreement that Carthage was unable to wage war in any form without the permission of the Roman Republic. And this even included defensive wars. Massinissa, a contemporary Numidian king and ally to Rome, would take full advantage of this deal between Rome and Carthage, as the Numidians were looking to expand, and their neighbors in Carthage had some territory to spare. Over the span of a few decades, Massinissa was slowly chipping away at Carthaginian holdings, and whenever his victims appealed to Rome, desperate to declare war back and defend their cities, the Romans refused and instead supported the Numidians. For a stunning amount of time, the beaten down Carthaginians actually obeyed this demand and refrained from military action. But this would eventually change. In 151 BC, Carthage had had enough. Under attack yet again from the Numidians, the contemporary Carthaginian general Hasdrubal the Boat Harch mobilized a significant army and launched a counteroffensive. Although Carthage would ultimately lose the conflict and Hasdrubal would be sentenced to death for his breach of the treaty with Rome, the latter was far from forgiving when it came to the Carthaginians. Instead of recognizing the stagnant military weakness of Carthage, an important handful of Roman senators insisted now more than ever that Carthage posed a threat to the Roman Republic, and therefore must be destroyed. No one knows exactly why the Senate soon decided that war with Carthage was best. Some attributed to greed, others to the threat of commercial competition, or potentially even a fear of political rivalry. 
Theories abound, and none have been proven as fact, but we do know the opinions of a couple Roman senators who spared over the matter for some time. One, by the name of Scipio Nazica, argued that Carthage must remain intact, even if weakened. The constant looming possibility of a threat from Carthage could be used by Roman officials to keep the Republic united and the people under better control. On the flip side, and the eventual winning side, was Cato. Remembered for his strong anti-Carthage sentiments, Cato believed that Carthage must be destroyed, and the matter was that simple. With the indemnity paid off and its economy growing, Carthage had made itself appear even more threatening to those who wished to convince the Romans that it really was. And with the unapproved military action against the Numidians, the Carthaginians were nearly handing the Romans reasons to declare war. Still, there were attempts made by Carthage to de-escalate through diplomacy once word got out of the Roman senators' ambitions. It was too late for negotiations, though. Cato's faction had won the debate, and Rome knew what Rome wanted. The downfall of the Carthaginians. In 149 BC, a massive Roman army led by co-consuls Manius Manilius and Lucius Calpurnius Piso landed at the port city of Utica, not far from Carthage itself. It had already been decided by Rome that war was inevitable, but the Carthaginians were determined to save their city through diplomacy and subsequently sent an embassy to meet with the Romans and make peace. Rome reacted first by attempting to disarm the Carthaginians and, when obeyed, next demanded that the city of Carthage be abandoned and then destroyed upon the Carthaginian relocation. It was at this point that the Carthaginians had had enough and finally understood that they only had one option left. They must defend their city at all costs. Recognizing now that Rome could never be a friend, the Carthaginians released the condemned Hasdrubal from death row and informed him that he was needed once again to defend the city of Carthage, but this time from the Romans. When the latter arrived at the city walls, they quickly understood that they would have to besiege the city as they were unable to get past the barriers. This led to a fairly slow development for the first portion of the war, as Carthage attempted to disrupt Roman supply lines and damage their ships, but only found minimal success as the invaders managed to defend themselves while trying to break through the Carthaginian defenses. Small-scale, off-and-on skirmishes continued into the following year, at which point Rome decided to change up its strategy a bit after the election of new consuls. Instead of continuing with such a heavy siege of Carthage, it seems more possible to first defeat all of Carthage's friendly neighbors and then deal with the weakened city itself. This plan was only minimally successful, though. Most of the Carthaginian allies held up just fine against Roman assaults, but things changed yet again when the grandson of the great Scipio Africanus, also named Scipio, was elected consul in 147 BC in order to give him full command of the campaign. And this was just what Rome needed. Meanwhile though, within the walls of Carthage, Hasdrubal had lost either faith in or respect for his own government and decided that the only solution was for him to take over. So, he did exactly that, overthrowing the current authorities and now controlling not only the military, but the entire city. This was just in time for Scipio's appointment as consul and meant that the remainder of the war would showcase the wit and skill of both men, face to face. Upon his appointment as consul, Scipio got right to resolving one of the main issues that the Romans were facing, and that was a plethora of poorly disciplined and motivated troops, all of which the new authorities swiftly dismissed. Those who remained were now held to a higher standard of effort and efficiency. Scipio was then focused on once and for all breaking through the city's defenses, and to this extent, he quickly found success. In the dark of the night, he and a few thousand of his men breached the city walls and forced the Carthaginian defense to flee. 
Nevertheless, this victory was only partial, as Scipio recognized the risks of remaining inside the city walls with such a small force and opted to withdraw before daylight broke. Both leaders were now angry for different reasons. Hasdrubal was furious with his defense forces for not only failing to stop the Roman advance, but then for fleeing the scene. On the other hand, Scipio was angry at the fact that Roman progress was still slow, and they had failed to cut off the supply of necessities by sea into Carthage. In a show of force, Hasdrubal put on a display of torturing his Roman prisoners of war, while Scipio tried to cut Carthage off from outside help. Neither action really did much, and a full-blown battle soon broke out on the seas. The events that followed led to more Roman progress against Carthaginian troops and fortifications, but still nothing monumental, and not what Scipio wanted. It wouldn't be until 146 BC that the Roman consul would get his wish, ready to bring an end to the war. As spring rolled around, Scipio launched a new siege on the city, which this time actually worked. The Romans entered the city with rage in their hearts and destruction on their minds. Over the next week, Scipio led his men in a scorched earth rampage, massacring the citizens of Carthage and burning the city to the ground. Only 50,000 Carthaginians were spared, and only then to be taken prisoner and sold into slavery. Hasdrubal, to the disgust of his own wife who chose death instead, surrendered. Scipio agreed to let him live, and not to make him a slave as would happen to the others. But that was all the Romans had to offer. Carthage was gone. Hasdrubal lost everything, and Rome got what it had wished for. The surrounding territory that had belonged to Carthage were also seized by the Romans, and it was clear by now that the Carthaginian Empire was no more. After three years, each tipping the scales further and further in favor of the Roman Republic, there would no longer be a doubt that when it came to Rome and Carthage, the latter ultimately collapsed. But while the Punic Wars were a pillar of Rome's early history, they were not all that occurred during this era. In fact, throughout the Punic Wars, the history of Rome was made up of much, much more. In the final centuries of the BC era, the Roman Republic had found friendship in the Hellenistic confederation known as the Achaean League. Having shared a bond since the Second Macedonian War, the Romans and the Achaeans made a remarkable team, or at least they had for a while. As things often go in ancient Rome, this alliance had reached its peak, and the trip downhill was quick and rocky. Internal struggles within the Achaean League and debate over just how involved it should allow Rome to be in its affairs were early signs of the coming breakup. Rome would also stir the pot after taking thousands of Achaean hostages during the Third Macedonian War a decision they became set in defending, despite pressure from the Achaeans to release the hostages. Ever-evolving disputations continued to thus exacerbate these growing problems. While Rome had to focus on the Fourth Macedonian War and the Third Punic War, the Achaeans were distracted by a more personal conflict with Sparta, something Rome also eyed diligently. In short order, with the Third Punic War coming to an end, Rome began to pay even more heedful attention to what was happening over in Greece, and a new push to minimize the growing power of the Achaean League would take tensions to a whole new level. Rapidly reaching their breaking point with Rome's meddling, the Greeks reacted much stronger than the Romans had anticipated. The Achaean League declared war on Sparta. Whether the Achaeans had also declared war on the Roman Republic or not is unknown. Either way, the Greeks knew that the act of striking Sparta alone would put them face to face with their former allies, 
and warring with the Romans would be far from easy. The initial answer from the Republic was to send two separate armies to put a brisk end to the Achaeans' impermissible war. The first army to arrive, under Quintus Caecilius Metellus Macedonicus, would march intrepidly toward Cretolaus and his Achaean army, which were currently laying siege to Heraclea in Trachis. Receiving word of the nearing Romans, Cretolaus attempted to retreat but was caught by Macedonicus at Scarfea, where a hasty battle unfolded. The following death of Cretolaus, not by sword or spear, but either by poison or drowning, caused the Achaeans to stumble in their response to the attacking Roman armies. Some members of the League opted to impulsively surrender to the Romans, though others chose instead to support a continued fight against the Republic led by a new figure in Crito Laus's place, Dius. And now, as Dius was dauntlessly rallying his own forces, Rome's second army, under the command of Lucius Mummius Achaicus, began devising an attack on Corinth. Dius's 650 cavalry and 13,500 strong infantry were impressive, but less so in humble comparison to Mummius's 3,500 cavalry and 23,000 strong infantry. The Achaeans had a chance, but a chance was nothing of a kind with an assured victory. The armies had been prepared for a magnificent clash, but instead, Dios had chicken-heartedly run off, mercilessly murdering his wife and taking his own life in Megalopolis, abandoning the Achaean troops and as a horrible consequence, losing Corinth entirely. Many from the city had moreover fled, whilst those who didn't were either massacred in the case of the men or enslaved in that of the women and children. The rest of the Achaeans subsequently crumbled at the feet of the unconquerable Romans. While some autonomy would remain due to the way the Republic chose to reorganize the region, there was no doubt now just how involved Rome would be in Achaean affairs, and it would be quite a lot. It wasn't just the Greeks whom Rome was meddling with, however. The Republic had long been grappling for control in the Iberian Peninsula, and not long after the resolution of the Achaean War, a new conflict erupted with the Celtiberians. Repeated spats between the Romans and Celtiberians had plagued the prior decades, and it was now the people of Numantia who attempted to challenge Roman control in the peninsula. The conflict was grueling for both sides and started only a few years after the Republic had bested the Achaeans, then lasting until 133 BC when the Romans, by the hand of the champion of Carthage Scipio, managed to essentially starve the Numantines into surrender. All while this was going on, the Romans had additionally been fighting to quash the Lusitanians of Hispania Ulterior something they came up successfully from shortly before putting a final conclusive end to the rebellions by the Celtiberians. And yet still, these were not all of the pivotal events that occurred during the 130s BC. In fact, one remarkable occurrence during this period was the stunning act by the final king of Pergamon, Attalus III, who handed over the whole of his kingdom to the Roman Republic. The exceptional virtue of this development stood in stark contrast to another event of the period, the murder of Tiberius Gracchus. Gracchus had earned himself the office of Tribune of the Plebs, a position that allowed him to preside over the People's Assembly and pass agrarian reforms that were fatally unpopular with members of the Senate. It would be his gallant bid for re-election as Tribune, however, that would push his enemies to the fanatical. 
Gracchus and his supporters were thus ruthlessly beaten to death by a vicious mob riled up by the Tribune's cousin, Publius Cornelius Scipio Nesica. The tragedy was unfortunate, but not all that scarce in Rome, though still a bit of a damper on the Republic's recent successes. The following years would furthermore be fairly routine. Organization of territories, new laws passed, and by 112 BC, another significant international conflict. Ever since the Third Punic War, the Romans had found a sound ally in the North African kingdom of Numidia. A former neighbor to Carthage, King Masinissa of Numidia had been a friend to the Roman Republic, and it was assumed that his son and successor, Mechipsa, would be as well. King Mechipsa thus never proved to be a problem for the Romans, at least until he died. Upon his unsuitable passing, he left behind three potential heirs to the kingdom. In hopes of resolving this predicament, specifically worried that his nephew would seize the throne from his sons, Machipsa had adopted his nephew, Jugurtha, and declared both of his sons, Adurbal and Hepsal I and Jugurtha, to be his rightful heirs. The trio was subsequently meant to rule together upon the king's passing, although this cooperation was depressingly short-lived. The immediate resolution was supposed to be a dividing of Numidia into three separate kingdoms, but this proved to be difficult and led to open warfare between the relatives. The end result would be the untimely death of both of Machipsa's biological sons and the massacre of Roman citizens who had aided Adurbal, prompting Rome to reluctantly declare war. The Jugurthine War was one of corruption, inconsistency, and was driven by heightening anger from the people of Rome who saw through the immorality. Initially, Jugurtha had persuaded members of the Roman Senate to grant him a remarkably kind peace deal, but soon more pleas by the people of the Republic forced Rome to call off the unscrupulous treaty. Military conflict was then back on, but Roman surrender followed, as would a peace deal made by Spurius Postumius Albinus, yet not acknowledged by the Senate. In response, Quintus Metellus was sent to lead the Roman army instead, and the war was back on yet again. The Roman campaign was now carrying on adequately, but swelling internal struggles between Metellus and his lieutenant-turned-successor Gaius Marius began to crack its foundation. This time, there would come a lasting conclusion to the war. Thanks to the father-in-law of Jugurtha, Bocchus, the Numidian king was soon brought to Roman quester Lucius Cornelius Sulla in chains, disgracefully defeated and now mortifyingly a prisoner. His men were massacred and kingdom gifted to his half-brother and Bocchus. The real victor of this clash in contrast then was Gaius Marius. The man would go on to earn seven consulships, five of them occurring consecutively. He would also institute a series of revolutionary military changes referred to as the Marian Reforms. These changes were implemented in 107 BC and remained almost entirely untouched until the ultimate collapse of the Roman Empire. A few years prior to Marius' reforms, nevertheless, the Roman military would be used yet again. This time, this time, it was back to brawling with the Celts, these ones of Germanic origin. A period known as the Cimbrian War saw an invasion of Roman-controlled territory by the Cimbri and Teutons, and by 101 BC had pushed to Italy itself. The Romans would come out triumphant, and the Cimbri in particular nearly wiped off the face of the earth by the end of it all. It was beginning to look like the Romans were undefeatable, and yet it was around this same time that 
that domestic contention began to chip away at the strength of the Republic. Slave rebellions would be some of the biggest challenges of this time, as the Romans found it increasingly difficult to keep a handle on some of their lower class residents. Sicily in 135 BC would be the scene of the first servile war, one of these such troubling revolts. This particular war had a wildly peculiar trigger. A slave by the name of Eunice claims to be a prophet, and with the help of his growing supporters, fellow slaves, he craftily managed to capture the city of Enna. Eunice and his new commander, Cilician slave Cleon, then went on to wage a full-blown campaign of rebellion against the Roman Republic, something that the Roman army early on labored to stamp out. Even after laying siege to the slave-controlled cities in 134 BC, it took roughly two more years for the rebellion to finally come to an end. And still, round two would come in 104 BC, when the Republic reversed a decision to have all slaves from Roman allies freed. This, quite understandably, sent unbridled fury through the ranks of these hundreds of slaves, who thus revolted. This second servile war also played out within Sicily's borders, and once more made it progressively difficult for the Romans to quell the growing mutiny. After three years, the slaves would again, at length, be defeated. But this repeated altercation and the struggle it took for the Republic to best their challengers, albeit a band of angry slaves, was beginning to shine a glaringly bright light on the weaknesses within Rome's structure. This came in startling contrast to its earlier victories and displays of great power, marking a magnifying decline of the Roman Republic. There would be, in due course, a third servile war in 73 BC that would show the true progress of ruinous erosion happening within the Republic, but not before another tussle known as the Social War. Beginning in 91 BC, this was more treacherous than a slave rebellion. It was a war on friends. A clash between the Roman Republic and a hurtful some of its allies. These longtime friends of the Republic were growing increasingly unsatisfied with their positions as lesser status, lacking Roman citizenship and all that comes along with it. Rome was repulsed by this idea, only displeasing their allies further, who would not back down on this new demand for equality. As often was the case when discord rang out in the vicinity of Rome, the situation inevitably turned to warfare. These hostilities would last for four years in total, and by the end of it, Rome had both won and lost. On the one hand, they managed to maintain decent relations with their comrades as some surrendered and others simply chose to remain loyal. And yet, on the other hand, they lost, because the only way to make the first part true was for the Republic to finally agree to their allies' demands and grant citizenship to all residents of peninsular Italy. Nevertheless, life went on, and there were still ever-growing problems at home that needed Roman attention. A few years after the debacle with the Republic's allies, one of Rome's own stirred up a new plight. The man who had been handed the King of Numidia in chains, Lucius Cornelius Sulla, marched on the capital of the Republic with one thing in mind, ultimate power. Sulla first seized control in Rome back in 88 BC, but shortly left to fight the first Mithridatic War against rebellious Greek cities led by King Mithridates VI of Pontus. After the Roman victory a few years later, Sulla audaciously marched back to Rome to continue pursuing his goals at home. While the challenger had been gone, he had left a trusted ally, Gnaeus Octavius, in his place at the helm of the Roman Republic. 
This substitute was later ousted by the exiled Gaius Marius, his son, and fellow opponent to Sulla, Lucius Cornelius Cina. The successful opposition then massacred supporters of Sulla, and Marius and Cina officially declared themselves to now be in the positions that Sulla had claimed for himself. Marius's days, however, were numbered, leaving Cina on his own as the ruler of Rome and the sole adversary to the returning and impassioned Sulla. An army under Lucius Valerius Flaccus was sent to meet up with Sulla and relieve him from his duties in the east, leading to Sulla winning over a handful of Flaccus' troops before he could reach his destination. By the time he landed in southern Italy, Sulla's forces would multiply even more as his old supporters, at least those who had avoided slaughter, flocked to his side yet again. The first battle of what would later be deemed Sulla's civil war thus came in 83 BC with the Battle of Mount Tifada, a clash that Sulla would easily win. Negotiations, more defections, and further battles would follow over the next few months, and the war would drag on until Sulla emerged victorious in 82 BC, crowning himself as dictator of the Roman Republic. While the new despot of the Roman Republic was busy gaining his title, Lucius Lucinus Murena was locked in a second Mithridatic War against Mithridates VI of Pontus, a conflict that would persist until an inconclusive pause was put on hostilities in 81 BC. Rome was doing as Rome does, fighting war after war after war fighting to maintain their power and supremacy in spite of corruption, internal strife, and general growing instability. The decade following Sulla's campaign to take Rome for himself would be marred by the Seratorian War, the Third Mithridatic War, and the Third Servile War. The first of these contests began in 80 BC and was yet another rebellion, this time sparked by a group of Roman, Celtic, Iberian, and other rebels who opposed Sulla's new authority. Quintus Sertorius, the namesake of the war, had been an opposition fighter during Sulla's civil war and now led the new hostilities against the dictator. The conflict would last for eight draining years, overlapping with the unrelated campaigns as it played out on the Iberian Peninsula. The light at the end of the tunnel could only be found when disloyalty within the opposition led Marcus Perperna to murder his alleged ally, Sertorius. Perperna was less of a challenge than his victim had been for Rome, and the great Pompey was quick to put an end to him as well. This was just in time, as the Republic was now fighting on two additional fronts. Over in Asia Minor, Rome was yet again facing off with Mithridates in what would be the largest and longest of the Mithridatic Wars, lasting a grueling ten years and pulling allies from multiple continents into the bloodshed. It was another damaging event for the Quivering Republic, and it wasn't all that Rome had to deal with. Also in 73 BC, the third and most famous of the Servile Wars broke out when 70 gladiators found freedom after escaping a gladiator school. It wasn't hard for these former slaves to stir up support amongst peers, and it wouldn't be long before their rebellious ranks reached over 100,000. Possibly the most famous of the gladiator force's leaders was Spartacus who became impeccable at fending off Roman armies to continue his revolt. His motives, and what he aimed for as his end goal of the rebellion, are widely debated by modern and even older historic tellings. Whatever it may be, Spartacus and his troops seemed unstoppable, at least until Marcus Licinius Crassus took command of the Roman side. The Roman army found Crassus to be much more petrifying than the enemy itself, and thus this fear violently pushed them to triumph. 
the Republic was finally able to crush the third and last servile rebellion, and Crassus, with the help of Pompey, who was on his way back to Italy from the expedition in the Mithridatic War, ensured the utter decimation of the rebellious slaves. It's believed that Spartacus himself was one of these casualties. Ever since the end of the Third Punic War, two things had been true about the Roman Republic. Try as it might, it was plagued by military conflict, and it was collapsing like a sandcastle under high tide with each strike of the sword. By the mid-first century BC, there was little hope left for the Republic, and the Romans knew it. And one man, born at the turn of the century, would be the final piece in the crumbling puzzle. Julius Caesar The mid-first century BC was a wildly eventful era for Rome, as was most of the Republic's existence. From the successful siege of Jerusalem in 63 BC, to the daring coup d'etat attempted by Lucius Sergius Catalina, now names the Catalinarian Conspiracy the same year, and then to the decision by Pompey to join the First Triumvirate, the 60s alone were packed full of important dates. But it was Pompey's ally in this trio who would come to overshadow much else in the final century BC. Born in July 100 BC, Gaius Julius Caesar was born to a patrician family with a father by the same name and a well-known uncle by the name of Gaius Marius, ally to Lucius Cornelius Cina and opponent to Lucius Cornelius Sulla. And it was these connections that, early into Caesar's adulthood, taught him just how complicated life can be. After the death of his father, Caesar was wed to Cornelia, the daughter of Cina, and named the High Priest of Jupiter. This post was an honor, but a short-lived one, because Sulla had eventually won control of Rome and quickly turns to people like Caesar who had been connected to the opposition. Sulla took everything from Marius' nephew without hesitation, his priesthood for one, his inheritance, and more. Unwilling to give in despite the immense pressure, young Caesar went into hiding. Despite his maternal family eventually intervening and softening Sulla's gaze on the young man, Caesar chose to stay far away from the dictator as an extra precaution. Now a soldier in the army, the young lad was earning respect and admiration already, even earning himself the civic crown before the death of the potent Sulla in 78 BC. It was at this point that Caesar opted to return to Rome, no longer under the heavy boot of his uncle's foe. Having lost so much, however, Caesar was only capable of finding a modest home surrounded by Rome's lower class, where he would begin a new career as a lawyer of his time. He found success here, just as he had in the army, although it was a short time later that his next obstacle presented itself. In 75 BC, Julius Caesar was captured by Cilician pirates while journeying across the Aegean Sea. Now 25 years old, Caesar was much less afraid of his captors than one would expect. Instead, when the pirates demanded a 20-talent ransom for the Roman noble, Caesar derided the men. He insisted that they surely didn't know who they had just snatched, and thus insisted they must ask for more. In fact, 30 more talents. Likely bewildered but pleasantly surprised, the pirates agreed to up the ransom and allowed Caesar to send off some of his men to go and gather the money. While the Roman and his captors waited over a month for the payoff to be brought, it seems that Caesar remained unperturbed by the entire situation. In fact, it's said that the rather egotistical 25-year-old was no stranger to ordering the pirates around and forcing them to listen to speeches and poetry he eloquently wrote in his spare time. Curiously, these Cilicians seemed quite fond of their Roman prisoner and treated him rather well. Caesar likely noticed this, 
But whether it meant much to him or not appears to be very clear. It didn't. At some point, before his ransom was paid, the young man informed his pirate custodians that upon his release, he would track every last one of them down, seize them, and have them all crucified while still alive. In what tone he made this threat, we don't know. But it couldn't have been too harsh, as the pirates chose to dismiss these words, and when Caesar truly was set free upon the payment of his ransom, they made no attempts to run or hide. Thus, Caesar went through the effort of rallying a small fleet, sailing back to the island he had been held on, abducting his former captors, and taking them back to Pergamon, where he eventually had them executed. When he finally returned to Rome, Caesar's legal career would from that point on become increasingly eclipsed by a budding political one. The first step would be his election, as military tribunal followed closely by the 69 BC election as quaestor. He would eventually serve out this latter position in Hispania after the death of Cornelia, staying out of Rome until 67 BC, at which point he returned and married a granddaughter of the late Sulla. Over the next five years, Caesar would earn the titles of Corulla Aedile, Pontifex Maximus, and Praetor. He would next become pro praetor over Hispania Ulterior as his relevancy, respectability, and power grew. Now styled Imperator as of 60 BC by his soldiers, Caesar was left with a difficult position. Stay in the army and receive a triumph ceremony from the Senate, or lay down his arms and run for consul, as he had already hoped to do. The seasoned lawyer, soldier, and now politician would eventually choose the latter. The election process was distasteful and thronged with corruption. But nevertheless, Caesar found a way to come out on top. He and Marcus Babulus would begin their consulships in 59 BC. It was during this stint as consul of Rome that Caesar's secret alliance with the likes of Marcus Licinius Crassus and Gnaeus Pompeius Magnus would become public knowledge. Previously, Caesar himself had built a relationship with both men, yet the two had been long at odds with one another. This led Caesar to attempts to mediate a reconciliation between the two that would in fact go quite well. The culmination of these efforts was the formation of the First Triumvirate, an initially secret alliance between these three men. But when Caesar proposed a new law during his consulship that called for forceful redistribution of public lands to the poor, Crassus and Pompey decided to take the triumvirate public, supporting the law and Caesar himself. Soldiers soon swarmed the city, and anyone who opposed the trio was quickly intimidated into submission or coincidental silence. What had started as the consulship of Julius Caesar and Marcus Babulus was now dubbed daringly the consulship of Julius and Caesar. This consulship of 59 BC was not without opposition, though it was furthermore not without violence imposed on those challengers. By now, the people of Rome were becoming increasingly aware of the First Triumvirate, and yet increasingly afraid of it at the same time. It was no secret that Caesar and his friends would use devious ways to achieve their goals. Still, they were rather good at it, and before his consulship was up, Caesar managed to secure himself the governorship over Caesalpine Gaul, Illyricum, and Transalpine Gaul an office he would thus hold for five years, keeping him safe for that time from any prosecution brought on by the deeds he'd carried out during his consulship. This was crucial because the astute politician had bigger plans for his next phase of life. With four legions now under his command in Gaul, and a coming extension of his governorship for another five years, Caesar had two main objectives conquer the unconquered lands of Gaul, and then enter Britain. Ambitious, maybe even foolish when it came to the latter, but nevertheless, it was what Julius Caesar wanted. 
He relatively smoothly found success in his first task, defeating the tribes of the unconquered region and inching ever closer to Britain's border. By 55 BC, he was ready to take that very next step. And under the accusation that the Brits had previously backed his opponents in the Gallic War, an invasion was launched. The results were a bit anticlimactic. Caesar was ill-prepared and ill-informed, causing him to first have to pull back into Gaul before again relaunching his fruitless campaign. He would return to Gaul again after achieving more than the first time, but still nothing significant. With the Gauls now in revolt, Caesar would be unable to return to Britain as he turned his attention back to his governorship. Despite valiant efforts from the Gauls, and one chieftain in particular, the Romans would be successful once more at putting down their opponents and claiming the rest of the Gallic territory bordering Caesar's. The Gauls were simply too disunified and unprepared to best their invaders, despite Caesar's forces not technically being all that stronger. Either way, Caesar was lucky as now he needed to turn his attention to whether or not he could even maintain enough support back home to remain in Gaul. One third of the first triumvirate, in the form of Crassus, was no longer in existence by the end of 53 BC. Having been killed during a campaign into Parthia, Crassus left behind only Caesar and Pompey, whose relationship was now on a downward spiral. Caesar's luck in particular appeared to be wearing thin, as Pompey and his supporters started to gain power in Rome, whilst the Senate was turning on Caesar. By the early months of 49 BC, the worst had come for Julius. Any tribunes who had had his back had been rashly expelled from Rome, and now the Senate declared him to be their enemy. What happened next is clear, but the reason for it is often debated by historians. It's possible that Caesar, in response to the Senate's decision, feared exile and potentially even prosecution. But many argue that this would have been an insanely unlikely outcome, and Caesar would have known that. Instead, he was more accurately focused on his goal of a second consulship, which Pompey currently in control of Rome, would have possibly attempted to bar Caesar from achieving. Thus, the die had been cast. Julius Caesar crossed the Rubicon with a lone legion and launched a civil war. Though the odds at first seemed to be far from in the disgraced assailant's favor, reality soon hit the Senate like a ton of bricks. The people of Rome cared not to defend their morally questionable politicians, and the men who had fought alongside Caesar under multiple legions were quick to support their comrade. Realizing the gravity of their mistakes, Pompey and some of his senators fled the city, withdrawing to the south where they believed they would be safer as Caesar marched on Rome itself. Yet they were wrong again. After failed negotiations that had been initiated by Caesar himself, the attackers too turned south. Caesar wanted not to capture Rome first, but to capture Pompey. The subsequent timeline of events saw Pompey flee for Greece. Caesar head off for Hispania, while an ally, Mark Antony, remained in Italy on his behalf followed by multiple clashes between the forces of Caesar and Pompey. Scores of soldiers were now flocking to Caesar's side as legion after legion joined his ranks. Pompey was soon fleeing for Egypt, where Caesar readily followed him to. What he intended to do with his now former ally is unknown, but what is documented is his immense dissatisfaction when he was informed of Pompey's assassination at the hands of Egypt's King Ptolemy XIII's men. Ptolemy had hoped to make a good impression on the Roman, but it seems that exactly the opposite occurred, and Caesar had instead taken a liking to the king's sister, Cleopatra. This, and likely also the assassination of Pompey, 
pushed Caesar to side with the Egyptian queen in the Alexandrine War, later defeating Ptolemy and leaving the now-subdued Egypt for Asia Minor. By now, Caesar had been appointed as dictator back in Rome, despite being in and out of Italy as a whole to engage in campaigns in the Middle East and Africa as well as his endeavors in Asia. He was also repeatedly named consul and his dictatorship renewed multiple times, having pardoned his enemies in the Senate and thus laying claim to very few opponents at home. Once he finally returned to Rome again in the 40s BC, Caesar began to roll out new legal reforms, even changing the Roman calendar. He was essentially the sole authority in the crumbling Roman Republic, if one could even still call it that, holding the titles of dictator, tribune, and consul. While he would, in fact, resign from the latter position in 45 BC, his successors were only once more decided by election given Caesar's decision shortly after to make all appointments of magistrates, tribunes, and consul his own selection. Despite being capable of making all of these unilateral judgments and wielding such grasping power, Caesar's popularity in the Senate was dwindling, not surging. He wasn't accomplishing these things with the support of his senators, but instead, in spite of lacking it. Still, hatred, often in these cases, is a fast-growing weed, and seeds are spread rapidly from the mind of one suppressed politician to another. Senators such as those in Rome could only take so much of Caesar's overbearing authority. People got to talking, ideas began swirling, and a devious plot was forming. A man by the name of Servilius Casca soon warned Mark Antony of the building conspiracy, but the senators had accounted for this. There was nothing left to be done. Caesar's days were numbered, and the clock was ticking ever faster. In the year 44 BC, on the Ides of March, Julius Caesar, dictator of Rome, arrived at the Senate, none the wiser to what was about to take place. He was, it's believed, aware that there had been some talk behind his back of some sort, but he surely did not know the full extent of what his senators were preparing to do on the floor of the theater of Pompey. Earlier that morning, Caesar's wife had awoken from a ghastly nightmare in which the great ruler had been dreadfully killed. She thus desperately begged him to stay home, finally convincing Caesar to have the Senate dismissed. After Mark Antony arrived to inform the senators of this, Decimus Junius Brutus Albinus, not the same Brutus now famous for his involvement in the conspiracy to come, made his way to Caesar's home to personally persuade him not to listen to the fears of his wife. After some talking, the dictator now gave in to the deceitful pleas of Decimus and decided to attend the Senate. Mark Antony now endeavored to join his friend and ally, but was stopped on his way into the building and detained, either by Decimus or a Gaius Trebonius. Caesar thus entered alone, at which point he was approached by Lucius Cilius Cimber, who addressed Caesar with an appeal to recall his exiled brother. The dictator showed no interest in listening to the man until Cimber grabbed him roughly by the shoulder, yanking down his toga. Why, this is violence, Caesar is said to have bellowed in response, at which point Publius Servilius Casca Longus promptly brought out a glistening blade and he attempted to sink it into the dictator's neck. Caesar, being quick in his reflexes, turns just in time to catch Casca's arm, at which point the latter shouted, Brother, help me! Caesar managed to then frantically fight Casca off, but by now, it was too late. He was surrounded, and a total of at least 60 conniving senators took their shot at the defenseless tyrant. For the first few moments, Julius Caesar hopelessly attempted to free himself from the mob, but he soon stumbled to the floor, where he then lay powerless. <laughs> 
covered in his own blood, and by the end, perforated by 23 stab wounds. It was later stated that the mighty and esteemed Roman's cruel death had come from the loss of blood, with the vast majority of his wounds not having been fatal on their own. And so, the great ruler of Rome, Gaius Julius Caesar, bled out on the steps of the Curia of Pompey, his body left there to drain for hours by his killers. The senators, after finishing the deed, paraded through the city, declaring the newfound freedom of the Romans from Caesar's hold, anticipating to be met with elation and gratitude from the citizenry. They were instead met with silence and rage. The immediate aftermath of the killing was chaotic. Mark Antony had fled in fear of his own life. Angry citizens set fire to the Senate House. What would come next for the government was uncertain and would need to be quickly resolved. But one thing was beyond doubt. This was the end of the Roman Republic. With Caesar, it had died on those stairs. Only days after his ally had been assassinated, Mark Antony returns to Rome. He hopes to quickly stabilize the government by negotiating with the killers and wielding the fury of the mourning of the citizenry as a weapon against them. Antony was very likely hoping to take control of Rome himself, having been unaware that prior to his death, Caesar had in his will named his grand-nephew, Gaius Octavius, as his one and only heir. Ironically, it was also decided that if Octavius, a rather sickly young boy, were to die before Caesar, Decimus Junius Brutus Albinus would be the replacement heir, still not Mark Antony. The death of the great dictator Julius Caesar had quite dramatically hammered the final nail into the coffin of the Roman Republic. Its fate had been sealed but there was still much to be done before it would officially be laid to rest. Mark Antony, still serving as consul yet now aware that he had failed to earn the place as Caesar's chosen heir, was working tirelessly to cement his own power and sway in the developing situation. He had somehow managed to nominally snag for himself the governorships of Cisalpine and Transalpine Gaul and played the ringleader in the effort to put a leash on the conspirators and their supporters. This was easier to do than one might expect, given the fact that, as a result of Caesar's murder, the dictatorship he had held was abolished, giving his heir, Octavian, little to claim. Nevertheless, neither of the men was keen to cooperate nor see the other gain any kind of upper hand, and thus, War began. The first signs of warfare approaching came at the end of 44 BC, when Mark Antony journeyed to the city of Mutina with the goal of taking Cisalpine Gaul by military force. This was necessary due to the fact that the region's current governor, Decimus Junius Brutus Albinus, one of Julius Caesar's killers, was unwilling to accept the law that Antony had earlier passed which would have given him the two governorships in Gaul. His law was seen as wildly illegal, and thus Brutus was determined to fight it. Antony subsequently laid siege to Mutina, quite possibly severing the final positive ties he'd had left with the Roman Senate. They now responded to the treacherous siege by sending the New Year's consuls Aulus Hirtius and Gaius Vibius Pansa alongside Octavian himself to defend the governor. The Senate's plan worked. As Antony and his men were forced to defend themselves against the approaching armies, the siege of Mutina softened. Both consuls would end up dead, but the siege would be lifted after Hirtius and Octavian attacked Antony's camp, scaring him into believing another assault would come soon. That, however, was the full extent of the Senate's victory. Octavian, furthermore, was now no longer willing to work with his uncle's killer, and Brutus was convinced to abandon his post. 
he hopes to flee to Macedonia, where he would join some of his fellow conspirators, but an ally of Antony would deliver the man's demise along the way. And back in Rome, Mark Antony was now declared an enemy of the state. Meanwhile, two consulship positions were suddenly vacant. The latter fact was one that Octavian took great pleasure in, as he had eyes on the role for himself. Marching to Rome, the heir to Julius Caesar took what he wanted, and alongside his cousin, Quintus Pedius, he took his place as consul. Among the first changes that Octavian and Pegius now made was the curious decision to revoke the declaration making Mark Antony an enemy of Rome. With Octavian himself and Antony being two of the most prominent supporters of Caesar remaining, the former decided that it would serve him well to form an alliance with the latter. Another massive supporter of Julius Caesar and a man of significant influence Marcus Aemilius Lepidus had already negotiated with Mark Antony, either by his own accord or because Lepidus' troops had insisted upon it. Likewise, all of those forces who supported Caesar were now pressuring Octavian to do the same, and thus, after meeting with the other men, Caesar's heir, Mark Antony, and Marcus Aemilius Lepidus entered into what is now known as the Second Triumvirate. This new friendship of sorts was solidified with the passage of the Lex Titia, modeled after Sulla's Lex Valeria, and granted the Triumvir's political and legal powers that outshined that of the consuls. The trio would also walk back on earlier agreements to let those who conspired against Julius Caesar off the hook, and in a violent turnaround, had hundreds executed. Further, the lands of the Republic were divvied out between the men, with Octavian taking Africa, Sicily, and Sardinia, Antony winning Cisalpine and Gaul as he had hoped for prior, and Lepidus being gifted Spain and Narbonessis. Next, there was the problem of the other assassins, the Liberatores, as Gaius Cassius Longinus and Marcus Unius Brutus were known. Having escaped prosecution of any kind in Rome, Cassius and Brutus had fled east, where they were attempting to take control of all eastern Roman territories whilst the Triumvirs were in the west. As 42 BC rolled around, however, Antony and Octavian were on their way to the east. The Liberatore's civil war officially began with the Battle of Philippi. As the fall leaves began to turn, Mark Antony came face to face with Cassius Longinus, while Brutus and Octavian squared off. The fight between Caesar's heir and friends turned killer seems like a fair match, and there fails to be one side with a clear advantage, quite contrary to the clash between the forces of Antony and Cassius. The Caesarian beat down his opponent, but Cassius managed to initially escape the battle alive. Despite the truth being far different, Cassius had then heard that his ally had been routed and in dramatic fashion. He reacted to the false news by taking his own life. Now alone in the fight, Brutus managed to take the reins of Cassius's abandoned forces and both he and his foes withdrew from the battlefield. The Triumvirs and Liberatores now began attempting to reignite their armies with promises of more money, as Octavian, Antony, and Brutus looked for what their next steps would be. Brutus was hoping to avoid a pitched battle just yet, and with the Liberatore's fleet having defeated the Triumvirs on the Ionian Sea, Brutus may have been in a fair position if he was able to do just that. The risk of masses of Caesar's veterans now in the Liberatore forces defecting to Octavian and Antony's side was one worth constantly considering, and when some of Brutus's other forces began to do just that, there wasn't much left that could be done. The Liberatore had to either fight and fight now, or run with his tail between his legs in a humiliating defeat. Brutus chose the first option, 
though the second may have been better in the end, as the result of an October 23rd battle was the trouncing of his forces and the suicide of the remaining Liberatore. Many surviving members of Brutus and Cassius's forces subsequently joined the Caesarian fight, as did a handful of nobles who had thus far opposed Octavian and Antony. When the body of Brutus was discovered amongst the carnage in the aftermath, it is said that Mark Antony paid his respects to his deceased foe and former friend by laying a purple cloth over his corpse. A symbolic moment, putting a face to the true ramifications of the ongoing civil war of the Roman Republic and its remains. Friend against friend, brother against brother, rival factions and political games had torn Rome apart. And as was the way of the Romans, alliances were short-lived and friends were quick to become enemies. The second triumvirate was no different. Following the war against the Liberatores, the members of the three-way alliance split up geographically, particularly Antony and Octavian, the latter of which had to now move on to facing Sextus Pompey in Sicily, whilst Antony focused on the east and Parthia. Cleopatra would also enter the picture again, this time striking up an affair with Antony, much as she had with Caesar before him. This allowed Antony and Cleopatra an advantage. Both could use each other to strengthen their own positions. But, after all, this was an adulterous relationship. Antony had a wife back in Rome, and that wife of his was not one to be ignored. As the Parthians readied for a preemptive attack against some of Rome's eastern holdings, Antony's wife, Fulvia, alongside Lucius Antonius, consul and brother to Mark Antony, were mapping out their own plans for war. Amongst domestic unrest triggered by Octavian's treatment of his veterans and ongoing war with Sextus Pompey, Fulvia and Antonius decided to target the Triumvir personally with a slew of propaganda and only fans the flames of the ongoing discontent. The situation soon escalated to the point of Antonius's military occupation of Rome and subsequent warfare against the forces of Octavian. The debacle was short-lived, lasting only from 41 through 40 BC and ending in a victory for Octavian, who eventually seized Perugia as a result. Both Antonius and Fulvia were allowed to live, and at the request of Octavian's soldiers, so were those belonging to Antony's family. And while Antony himself had stayed absent during the clashes, feigning distraction throughout it all, he was now watching his fellow triumvir with mild suspicion. Octavian had taken more than Perusia. He had furthermore seized Gaul after the death of Antony's governor and held additional territory elsewhere within Rome's grasp. With distrust being one of the pillars holding up the might of the Second Triumvirate, it's no surprise that Antony thus dropped everything to return to Italy with an army of his own, just in case. As another just in case, Antony furthermore attempted to enter discussion with Octavian's current nemesis, Sextus Pompey. This plan worked well enough, but it led Antony into direct conflict with Octavian's garrison at Brundisium. Had it not been for the pleas of both armies to make peace, the scuffle could have turned into yet another civil war. But alas, the soldiers managed again to trigger negotiations. Or maybe it was just that these Romans understood well the concept of fairness to their men. By the fall of 40 BC, an agreement had again been made between the triumvirs. Antony and Octavian's new positions in the east and Gaul respectively were made official, and Lepidus, the rather forgotten of the three allies, was confirmed in his new position over Africa. After brief celebrations at home, the renewed friends then looked back at Sextus Pompey with two options in mind. <laughs> 
sign a treaty, or win a war. As the scorching summer heat set in, so did negotiations. After discussing terms, such as solidifying Sextus's position over the Peloponnese, Corsica, Sardinia, and Sicily, for five years followed by a consulship, as well as compromises on behalf of Sextus's soldiers and slaves, an agreement was finally made. War could be avoided, for once, for now. Who was the strongest link in the triumvirate may be debated, but it seems in the deal struck between them and Sextus Pompey, Antony was the glue that held them all together. With the latter having shortly returned east and focused back on his victories against Parthia via his lieutenant Publius Ventidius, the relationship between Sextus and Octavian was now under a scorching spotlight. It was only a matter of months before tensions reached a flaming high with no Antony around to stomp them out. In an unexpected twist, Octavian had already retaken Corsica and Sardinia for Rome after one of Sextus's admirals had a change of heart and loyalty. Sextus had favored Antony over Octavian anyway, and this gave him the perfect excuse to throw their alliance aside on Caesar's heir. The sea battles showed an early advantage for Sextus, causing worry for Antony once more, as he now saw a risk of Sextus gaining too much power in comparison to both himself and Octavian. Thus, when his fellow triumvir asked for aid, Antony, though not necessarily in favor of Octavian, sailed back for Italy to discuss matters further. Allegedly, the only thing that pushed him to support Octavian over Sextus was the persuasion of Antony's newest wife and sister of Octavian, Octavia. Despite Antony's resistance, the triumvirate was again renewed, now more officially, and it was agreed that the deal made earlier with Sextus was no longer on the table. It was time for war, and Antony would support Octavian militarily. Antony additionally refocused his goals in the east against Parthia and his continuing affair with Cleopatra, who he now acknowledged he had impregnated as he granted her new lands. Those back in Rome, and really all of Italy, were displeased by this quite public entanglement, growing a crack in Antony's reputation that would soon be deepened by his coming failure against the Parthians. Having marched on the Parthian capital, Frata, and then being chased all the way back to Cappadocia after being abandoned by his alleged ally in the king of Armenia, Artavastes, Antony had turned the crack in his prestige into an expanding rupture. Meanwhile, Octavian and Lepidus, with the crucial aid of Octanian's lieutenant Marcus Vespanius Agrippa, founds their own triumphs against Sextus, who by the end of 36 BC was on the run, ironically, toward Mark Antony. Sextus's potential for a new treaty with Antony was not the biggest news of the moment. In fact, it was the neglected Lepidus who made metaphorical headlines with a sudden betrayal. After the defeat of Sextus, Lepidus, who'd long awaited his own glory, attempted to win over Octavian's men for himself. This plan disastrously backfired, and the unshakable Octavian reacted by, simply put, kicking Lepidus out of the Second Triumvirate. To say that the alliance still existed with only Antony and Octavian would be a foul joke. It appeared by now that Lepidus had, in the case of the Triumvirate, been the glue and now that glue was gone. As a result, there remained nothing standing in the way of another civil war, and Octavian now readied for just that. A propaganda war was the first form of battle to come, and displaying a quite impressive level of naivety, Antony made things ridiculously easy for Octavian. After having the fleeing Sextus executed, 
Antony went on to bamboozle his alleged ally in Armenia, seizing his kingdom and showing off this entire trickery in an ill-thought-out display of celebration. He then engaged in a yet more poorly evaluated ceremony with his children by Cleopatra, by now shattering the once positive reputation he'd earned entirely. Many in Rome had blamed corrupt morals for the repeated domestic conflicts and wars, and to see someone such as Mark Antony himself parading around in such scandalous and theatrical ways only gave the citizenry more reason to point the finger at him, not Octavian or anyone else. Yet, whether aware of his own self-destructive behavior or not, Antony decided to throw his own accusations back at Octavian, branding him scarcely short of a traitor. If there was truth in these imputations, it would seem not to matter much to all outside of Antony's circle. Octavian was winning the war of words. Mark Antony needed to prepare for one with swords. After forming a counter-senate of his own, Antony began readying his army. The sheer manpower of his force was quite incredible. 800 ships and 100,000 men were ready to fight for the Roman general. The only question was, should they also fight for Cleopatra? This question was answered in dramatic fashion when Antony opted to divorce his Roman wife, yet another reckless move for the stunningly ignorant Triumvir. Had he hoped to avoid further damage to his honor, he could have simply removed his Egyptian mistress from the equation, but he instead opted not only to keep Cleopatra around, but to divorce Octavia, a decision he had to know would have significant consequences in the eyes of the public, and of course, Octavian. Unsurprisingly thus, Antony began losing men. One in particular, Lucius Munatius Plancus, a former senator, switched allegiances, now joining up with Octavian. This man would be the first domino to fall in the race toward another war. It was at his urging that Octavian unseals the will of Mark Antony, which, according to him, showed his true loyalties to Egypt, leaving Roman lands to he and Cleopatra's children, recognizing Caesarian, Cleopatra's son with Caesar, among other damning requests. Octavian followed up this reveal by declaring war on Cleopatra. By September of 31 BC, the Allies turned foes alongside the Queen of Egypt herself clashed at the Battle of Actium. The battle on the Ionian Sea saw a fairly even force on either side. Leading up to the final clash, those on the side of Octavian had been repeatedly harassing the Greek coast as they waited to coax Antony and Cleopatra into true battle. The latter duo, however, had made a new plan to redistribute their forces, setting up garrisons and moving their fleets, something that Octavian quickly caught word of. After pensive debate with Agrippa, Caesar's heir decided that they mustn't let their enemies do as they intended, and that the battle must begin immediately. With Antony's men still deserting on a daily basis, any new ideas or strategies were also taken out of Antony's camp and brought right into the hands of Octavian. Finally realizing that he was more or less stuck and any chance at surprising the enemy was non-existent, Antony ordered his men into battle. What happened in the actual course of the battle is debated, but what is known is that by the end, Antony and Cleopatra fled while many of their ships and men sunk into the sea or went up in flames. The couple had squeezed through a treacherous gap to slip away, it seems, with no care for the men who'd been willing to risk it all to fight on their behalf. The following year, more desertions plagued Antony's troops. Cleopatra and Octavian had failed to come to any agreement during fruitless negotiations. Octavian was marching toward Alexandria. On the 1st of August, the city fell to the heir of Julius Caesar, 
Caesar's son by Cleopatra was murdered, as was Mark Antony's heir. Cleopatra's surviving children were captured, and the Roman triumvir with his Egyptian queen ended their lives together. Antony and Octavian had always been no more than pawns in one another's violent game of chess, but the Battle of Actium had been checkmate, and now the king and queen were dead. Gaius Julius Caesar Octavianus had won.